Hello, everyone. Uh, today, our guest is Britton Ladd, supply chain management consultant, micro fulfillment, and rapid grocery delivery expert. A person uh, for most of you uh, who doesn't need the introduction. Thank you, Britton, for finding time and joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. It has been almost a month of war in Ukraine, and it's quite visible uh, that this war is already influencing the world economies big time. The humanitarian crisis, world supply chain is going crazy, prices on everything are going up, and I believe that this is just the beginning. Today, I would really like to talk with you about how is it affecting the industry uh, both of us love so much. Uh, and I mean the rapid grocery delivery industry in today's market landscape, investment mood, uh, and the big changes that are happening worldwide. Well, we know for a fact that we've begun to see several changes already with the closure of bike, the closure of fridge no more. Um, now, certainly bike was impacted because they're a Russia backed company. Both founders are from Russia and they tried, but they couldn't raise any capital to really stay in business. Although they have a partnership with Grubhub, Grubhub didn't fund them. I think that was a mistake. I think Grubhub had a great opportunity actually to acquire bike, but we know that bike closed as for fridge no more. I think it's wrong to say that Fridge No More closed, frankly, because of the, the conflict in Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia. I've always believed that Fridge No More was always going to go out of business. They really didn't have a good business model. They would deliver anything. They didn't care how far their couriers had to ride. Uh, it was nothing for Fridge No More to accept an order for 18 cases of beer, which means they needed 18 couriers each taking one case of beer to a customer. And in something like that, what I told Fridge No More is I said, you, you can't do that. You need to say that's a special order. It's a higher cost. You don't send people on bikes. You basically use a vehicle or whatever. So I would certainly say, you know, Fridge No More closed because they didn't have a good business. But by closing, absolutely, that is a casualty of what's taking place with Ukraine and Russia, no doubt. What I also think is interesting is what I think what Ukraine is showing is that this is a really resilient business because multiple rapid grocery delivery companies have gone back to operating in Ukraine. And I think that's interesting that they've been able to do that. So at a high level, that's really what I've been seeing. Right. Actually, heads off Glovo uh, once again. Uh, I was ordering today uh, through Glovo from Glovo Express for my family in Kiev. And uh, there was like an hour when Glovo was not working because of the air alarm uh, and shootings. But basically after that, and after the uh, danger passed for some time, my family got an order from Glovo Express and it really arrived in 40 minutes, which is for me insane. <laughs> I mean, in the peace times, in New York, in London, where the business is completely different, people don't manage to do that. And Globo manages to do that during the war times when couriers are stopped on the way from their dark store to get checked of what they're carrying if they're not carrying weapons or something like that. You know, these are, this is the level of complications Globo and Bolt are getting right now and they are still managing to do that. Like heads off guys. Uh, and um, this is actually the topic uh, what I wanted to discuss with you. It's the necessity of the on-demand economy in general, because for now, in my particular case, it is the super necessary infrastructure, which is not luxury at all, uh, but something that can actually help me provide to my family, which is there. And I can do it on distance. I can do the donations. I can uh, order them food. Uh, it, it gives the restaurants help uh, to distribute their stuff. They're doing a lot of volunteering. That's, that's a huge thing right now because they have the logistics 
opportunities and the system. Uh, and I think that it is a very good picture to the whole world how important this last mile supply chain is. It's not just a luxury, right? Uh, and at the same time, I wanted to touch the topic of the business model in general, how fragile or anti-fragile it is. Because in general, uh, there are multiple angles we can look at today during the conversation. And I think there, ca there can be an interesting development around that. Oh, I agree. So let's, you, you asked, you asked, you brought up a lot of interesting um, topics there. So is the model important? Well, what I will say is this, the model is becoming more important. And I think the reason why the model is becoming more important is that consumers that have begun to be exposed to rapid grocery delivery, they like the fact that they can get things so quickly. That's number one. But number two, what we're seeing is that in addition to groceries, there's food deliveries, dark kitchens, uh, prepared meal delivery. And then you have very large grocery retailers, Kroger and Albertsons in the US and Publix and so on. Uh, all of them are wanting to start offering rapid grocery delivery to their customers. And as you and I have spoken many times, I've always said rapid grocery delivery cannot succeed if it's only about groceries. It has to be about rapid delivery of products across multiple categories. And so one of the things I'm expecting to see throughout 2022 are rapid grocery delivery companies, GoPuff and DoorDash and Gorillas and Getter and others, Glovo, Bold. I think they're going to start increasing the amount of categories that they they cover and the amount of products that they deliver. And I expect them to see a more of a bigger push on like things related to pharmacy, uh, things related to babies and baby food and healthcare, uh, health food, things like that. So I absolutely believe in the model. It's still not profitable and it won't be profitable without major changes. And I've written about this, I've spoken about this. And the thing that I will continue to say is I believe rapid grocery delivery companies need to do one of two things. Either they slow down so they can automate or they automate and then they slow down because the thing that's, that's inherently bad about their model is because they want to deliver something in 10 or 15 minutes, they have no ability to take advantage of automation. If they would just slow down the delivery to 30 minutes, they easily could automate dark stores, leverage automation to fulfill the orders and still be able to have 15 minutes left over for a courier to make a delivery. Also, I think this is the way the industry is going to go because we've already seen in Amsterdam, in Great Britain, in Spain and other countries, they're, they're beginning to resist dark stores they're beginning to resist dark stores even in the United States. And I think going to a model where they have fewer dark stores, but the ones that they have are automated, I think is going to help them. And I expect what you'll see is some of the major grocery retailers say, we're going to go with a model where we'll fulfill rapid grocery delivery orders from our stores, and then we'll supplement our network with strategic more nano fulfillment centers, smaller fulfillment centers that aren't necessarily automated. But I think you'll start to see that model here in the US fairly soon. Interesting. And uh, on the operations side, uh, I think that it's quite clear, uh, and we have discussed it with you a month ago, uh, that those are the steps that are needed uh, because Basically, it's not about groceries. It is about the fact that it is a retail model, right? It is the evolution of the hyper-local retail, and it doesn't necessarily have to be groceries. It has, like, it needs to be the delivery of everything because basically you need the scale and you need margins. Without this, uh, you cannot really have enough people in your model and you will not get enough cash to have all these micro fulfillment centers running. And of course, automatization. But if we look from the macro, 
Also, a month ago, we were discussing this from the angle that the money is going to keep on flowing. At the same time, right now, the mood of the investors, I do not think is the same as it was in December, because now you need to triple check in which region you're going to be investing. Who are the investors back in the companies right now? Because we see the companies with Russian roots are falling. Uh, it's just a fact, right? Frigino Moore was also uh, with the Russian funding and with the Russian founders. So it is a very tricky question right now. On the other hand, we see a lot of companies are losing money. Basically, all of them are losing money. You cannot like go uh, without that. It's a marathon and not everyone is going to win. We discussed that before. And now investors understand it and need to be more accurate and more careful, right? And all the kind of geopolitical and the war and the general tension on the market in terms of the capital, I think it could be kind of compared to the times of uh, the pandemic where investors understood that there might be a big chance that I would need to save my startups rather than invest into the new ones. So we basically see that the capital kind of ocean that was there right now, it's not as big anymore, right? And it's rather a very careful ocean. But at the same time, on the other hand, there is Getir, who just got the uh, over 700 million investment and over $12 billion uh, valuation, uh, which probably happened uh, before uh, everything started and it was just announced later, I think. But it's still a very, very high bar. How, what is your vision around this topic? Like, will the investment keep flowing? Who will get the investment? Like the landscape of the market. What are your thoughts around that? Well, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that it's a completely different rapid grocery delivery industry now, now that bike is out of the picture. I've always stated that Samacat, in Russia is really one of the best of the rapid grocery delivery companies. I thought Rodian and Slava who founded Bike were just fabulous, um, fabulously skilled individuals, really understood what they were doing. And so Bike was a really good company, but they're gone. Bike no longer exists. And so I think it's gonna be interesting to see how investors approach the industry now. And do I think the money will still be there? Yes. Do I think as much money is going to be there from as many investors? No. And the thing that I've had discussions with Getter about and, and Gorillas, Joker and others, the argument I've made to them is that they honestly need to step back and they need to pivot. And what they need to pivot on is immediately start addressing how do we get how do, we, how do we become profitable sooner? And how can we start making changes to our business model that give us really better sustainability, better growth opportunities? But most importantly, how do we attack all of the problems where we are losing money on every order we fulfill? I mean, the fact that Joker had been losing over $100 on orders, uh, you know, even bike, even fridge no more. Uh, they lose money on orders. Gorilla loses money on orders. Get here. They've got to address that problem. And the only way to address it again is by changing their business model. But I think that's okay. One of the, the things that I liked about working at Amazon is we used to have this leadership principle where it said leaders are right a lot. And the reason why leaders are right a lot is they are constantly evaluating the circumstances. They evaluate reality and they make adjustments. They don't just take one strategy and no matter what, follow it to the very end, regardless if it's the wrong strategy or not. So I think it's okay for Getir and Gorillas and Kaju and others and Uber, whatever, Deliveroo. It's fine for all these companies to say, we're gonna start making some adjustments because we need to make improvements in our model to where we're going to be more profitable. And I think it's going to be expected of them to do that, certainly by the investors that are out there. The smart investors are going to be the ones who say, time out. 
I want to know what your automation strategy is. I know you can open up dark stores. I know you can make deliveries. I know you can lose money on every order, but we need to get beyond that. So what's your automation strategy or what's your collaboration strategy with another rapid grocery delivery company? Again, the discussion I had with James Walker of Bike uh, before, before Bike went out of business, I said, James, I said, I think you need to be the one who goes to Gorillas and Getter and Bridge No More um, and, Door, and, and DoorDash and even GoPuff and say, what if we share facilities? What if we just share the same dark stores? We fill the same or our orders from the same dark store. So we have fewer dark stores throughout the city, but we share the cost of operating the dark stores and we just compete. We just compete with customers. And he was against the idea in the beginning. He, he, he wasn't sure about that. But then as we spoke, he was like, you know what? That's actually an interesting idea. And then I started to talk to, to gorillas and others. And there was a desire on the part to at least be willing to consider that. And I think as they expand in the US and other parts of Europe, I think these cities are going to say, you have to have fewer of these stores. And that's where I think collaborating with each other is going to be something to expect. But what we know for a fact is this, they can no longer keep using the argument that, well, we're new, it's a new industry, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to gain scale, we're trying to build our brand. Lots of other companies were also startups that had to scale, had to build the brand, and they weren't losing over $100 on every order they fulfilled. So there's an inherent, there is an inherent um, piece of the model, of the grocery model, the rapid grocery delivery model, that's simply flawed. And it's flawed by this. Rapid grocery delivery is the only model I've ever seen that guarantees you will lose money on every order you fulfill. It's not that maybe you'll lose money, it's a guarantee. I've never once been able to find how a rapid grocery delivery company is profitable regardless of what they're delivering because again, they're restricted by one courier making two deliveries an hour and the couriers are limited by what they can carry in terms of weight and volume. So if you have someone who says, I want an apple and a Coke, well, you'll deliver that and you'll lose money. If you have a customer who says, I need $50 worth of groceries and I need you to deliver that. Well, if you can't do it with one courier and it takes two, it's guaranteed you're going to lose money. So I think what we're going to see is that investors are going to push these companies to improve their model, improve their assortment come up with a strategy for automation. And I think that's what's going to save them. But the big thing, and I still believe we'll see it, I think it's only a matter of time before the grocery re the, the rapid grocery delivery companies stop talking about delivering in 15 minutes and they just say, we're going to deliver and we'll get it there as fast as we can. I think they're gonna have no choice. But as I've said before, I think the only way the rapid grocery delivery industry survives is by slowing down. I agree with the, most of the uh, of what you were saying. What I wanted to clarify is that you said that there is no company who is making money, right, on the orders, right? Not in general as a company, but on the orders. And there are examples of such companies. There are examples of such, such companies in China. Uh, Samokat, uh, also was making the money on the orders and they had profitable dark stores, right? Oh, that's true, and, but they're not the startups. They're not right, gorillas, right. they're not French okay. no more, they're not by, okay. I'm not talking, yeah, the companies in Perfect. China, I think are doing a fabulous job. Then, yeah. I, think some of the, I think some of the companies in India, um, because of the density of the population there, they have a little, of, they have an advantage. I think they're gonna get the profitability fairly soon. But what I've seen in terms of here in the U.S., nobody's making money at all. Uh, the majority of these companies in Europe are not really making money. These younger ones, the startups. But are there a few examples? Yes, Samacat especially. But Samacat had been in business for several years. It took them several right. years to get there. And so I've always said, 
I don't dispute that the rapid grocery delivery model can be improved to the point where it can be profitable. But what I've stated, and I stand behind this, the way the model is today for most of these companies, those companies won't be profitable. They, they, there's too many things that have to happen to get them there. And I'm not seeing those happen. So they need to make an adjustment to the model. Absolutely. It's just, I think, and this is what, this is what we have discussed with you many times uh, when we were just chatting about the industry. It, it even feels that it's not that the model of rapid grocery delivery is wrong. It's that uh, many players do not even understand that they are in retail and they need to think as if you are a retailer, building retail rather than just I deliver groceries in 15 minutes at all cost. And retail is much more than just delivering from A to B, right? It's about finding the right price metrics. It's about finding the right categories. It's about targeting the right people. It's about your service. It's about how you access friendly and many, many, many things, right? But would it be right now, um, would, it be, would it be the right statement if I say that 2020 and 2021 was were the, the years and the time where the industry, the whole on-demand industry was boosted immensely. And right now, all this industry, it is the time 2022, 2023 is the time where you get efficient or die because nobody is going to fund your expenses just for your growth. It's not the time where people can be throwing money out of the window anymore. And if you do not make adjustments, you just don't get other funding. Correct. I agree with that completely. And again, when I talk about these companies improving, I'm not talking about just adding additional categories. I'm talking about really stepping back and evaluating mm -hmm. what you know, what are these companies about? I mean, I think it's very important for Gorillas and Getter and these other companies to answer this question. Why do we exist? Why do we exist? Remember, these companies started because they were a gimmick. They were a gimmick company. They started because they came up with an idea for 15 and 10 minute delivery of groceries. It was a gimmick. And they, they talked to investors into giving them lots of money. But these companies can't become real companies if all they offer is a gimmick. And fast delivery of groceries is still pretty much a gimmick. Um, so they have to change that. And so with someone like Getir with a $12.5 billion evaluation, you know what? They could start make, they just start thinking about making acquisitions. They could actually start thinking about acquiring a grocery company in the United States. They're big enough, they could acquire the company Sprouts in the United States and have a presence in 38 states of retail stores. And now Getter looks at that and says, wait a minute, we can change our model. Gorillas is one of those companies that if they can raise some capital, they can look at it and say, you know what? We're actually going to change our model. We're gonna go after Instacart's customers. We're going to go after those retailers and say, let us do all of your rapid grocery delivery. Um, we'll actually, we'll actually focus just uh, our efforts just on your behalf. We'll work with you on some new programs as well. And, and maybe get, maybe Gorillas doesn't open up so many of their own stores and they basically partner with grocery retailers. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch how these companies adjust, but we know for a fact, they cannot maintain the status quo. It's not going to save them. And so, yeah, I agree with you. 2020, 2020, 2021 is we're here, we're making some noise, we're trying to get recognized, we're trying to be successful. 2022 is the year where all kinds of circumstances are now forcing investors to say to these companies, now you have to become better. You have to be, you have to prove you're better than what you were one and two years ago. So yes, I agree. I think that's what we're going to start to see. Very interesting times. Yes, yes. And then, of course, you know, we have to take a look at and see. So what does what does GoPuff do? What does DoorDash do? What does Grubhub do? 
I mean, we have to take a look at it and say, so what does Instacart do? You know, what do what, you know, what does Walmart do? What does Amazon do? So there's so many things all out there related to grocery that I won't be surprised if some of these companies get acquired. I won't be surprised if some of these companies make big investments and they start to go big in darks in a rapid grocery delivery. I fully anticipate that that DoorDash is going to keep investing heavily. I know for a fact DoorDash is certainly interested in automation and you know, automating their Dash Mart facilities. So I, I think we're going to see all kinds of interesting things this year, but I still cannot pick a winner at this time. The company I still think can win this is still DoorDash. Get here may have a $12.5 billion valuation. That's not enough. They're only operating, I think, in two cities in the U.S., and we're the largest market in the world. So we've got to see more from Get Here. We need to see more from Gorillas, And I think they're running out of time to do that. Uh, so that's what's going to be interesting to watch this year. And what do you think about the customer? Because right now, when just a month ago, basically, the day of the customer was different. The emotional state of the customer was a bit different. And right now, the information state is a bit different. And if previously, I did not really think that the price sensitivity could be a threat for rapid grocery delivery companies, because basically all the numbers in retail were showing that uh, people are going more and more to premium, right? The premium uh, kind of sector was growing. It was for grocery, it was for many, many uh, categories, right? And uh, I didn't feel that the industry was anyhow in danger from that perspective. And actually now I do, because people uh, see the prices on the gas stations, right? People see the prices in the stores, which are growing. Today, I read the news that the FMCGs would have to grow their prices at least 10% right now. And it's only going to be escalating. What do you think about the customer preferences right now and about the uh, basket of the customer and the behavior? Do you see these changes or do you think it's not going to be as major for the on-demand delivery industry? Well, we know for a fact that customer behavior is changing and it's only going to change more. As we go further into 2022, Gas prices are going to increase and food prices are going to increase even more. And that will have a ripple effect on the behavior of the customer. So that will certainly have an impact on the rapid grocery delivery companies. What amazes me the most is I'm not seeing the rapid grocery delivery companies taking advantage of the situation. I can assure you, if I was the CEO of Gorillas or Getter, I would be saying to my team, we're going to go even bigger in private label. We're going to come up with private label products that are a direct competitor to the largest brands in the United States. I'm going to have my private label peanut butter, and I'm going to say it's just as good as Skippy or Jif. I'm going to have my milk. I'm going to have my almond milk. I'm going to have meat. I'm going to have eggs. I'm going to have bread. And they're going to be just as good, but they're going to be private label products and I'm going to start pushing those a lot, but I'm gonna do something even smarter. I'm going to, on my platform, say, each of you have friends, each of you have family, each of you have companies you work for. So here's what I'm going to do. If you will convince your friends and family to place their orders exclusively through my website, my rapid grocery delivery company, I'm going to give you a discount for volume. So if five of you or 10 of you or 50 of you place an order for meat, milk, eggs, bread, and so forth, I'm going to take 10% off your total order or 15% because the more volume I have and the more sustained the volume is, the easier it is for me to then buy these products in bulk and I can pass the savings on to you. And so there's a company in China called Pinduo Duo. It's one of my favorite companies. And that's what they do. They basically invite families and friends to buy groceries together. 
to buy other products together and then they get a bulk discount. So if I'm Getter, if I'm Gorillas, I'm going to be going to neighborhoods in Chicago and New York and all throughout the US and I'm gonna say, I want you to get all your friends and family together. I want you to place these orders. And if you get it to where I'm delivering 50 gallons of milk in this neighborhood and I'm delivering, you know, 25 pounds of chicken or 100 pounds of chicken, the more that you can build up bulk orders in these neighborhoods, the bigger the discount I can give you and there's no shipping costs. And I'm telling you that is absolutely what is going, if Gorillas or Getter doesn't do it, I think they're making a terrible mistake, but GoPuff will do it, DoorDash will do it, some of the grocery retailers will do it, but that's the type of stuff I'm anticipating is going to happen. And those are the things I strongly recommend that someone like a Getter and Gorillas do. They have an advantage. They don't have a large infrastructure. They're still rather small, but they are also very nimble. So they should be able to listen to what I'm saying and say, we agree with them. We should be doing this. And they have developers who easily can make those adjustments to their platform so that friends and families can bid. And I still say, and I've told this to consumer, I said, con, I said, if I was you, I'd go to Tesla. And I would say to, to Elon Musk of Tesla, if your, bro, if your, if your workers, the, the, the individuals who work at Tesla will place their orders through me, just because they're Tesla, they get a 10% discount. We will become your dedicated provider of groceries. We'll even open up grocery stores on your manufacturing campuses. We'll put grocery stores and we'll deliver to the campus or we'll have the, or your workers can pick up the groceries and take home or we'll deliver them to the home. But again, go after these companies and offer them a discount because those customers are those workers and those workers are looking for everything they can to save money. And so basically what gorillas can do is say, I'm gonna reduce the food bill for every one of your customers and all they have to do is order my groceries. I think it's gonna be interesting to watch and I'm confident what I just described is going to happen. I really agree with you because basically in China, and I think that you provided a great context uh, about the market and actually not just the company that you mentioned does it, but the whole business model of, uh, for example, Miss Fresh there, is built on the fact that they are cheaper for the people ordering it than going to the shop. And the factor that the Chinese leave in the communities requires Miss Fresh to do stacking for these people and for the delivering orders. They deliver not in 15 minutes, but they deliver in 30 minutes up to 60 but they deliver 10 orders at a time and they deliver it within the community once they brought everything in bulk. And having the volume, they can provide a better value, better price than uh, the competitors offline. Another thing that I absolutely agree is the uh, private label. Uh, what I also believe that the uh, kitchens, uh, like the GoPuff kitchens and the ready food uh, is also another volume stream of customers, right? If you provide the value product, if it's good price and good quality, and you're delivering not just the Coca-Cola, but also a good price pizza, it's also adding up more value and you're being more relevant to the customers. And this is what the companies are already doing, right? Gorillas and Frichty, Frichty, sorry guys, uh, <laughs> if the pronunciation is wrong, but the gope of kitchens, the same. So we can also see the unions of RIF and some food uh, grocery delivery companies. What do you think about this idea? Oh, I agree completely. And I've written about this. I've spoken about this. I There's a company called Muncho, M-U-N-C-H-O in the United States. And they're starting to deliver pizzas that they make inside a van. And so they make this delivery of these pizzas and I've spoken with them and I've worked with other companies on designing this model. I worked with a company called Zoom. I designed the strategy for Amazon where I made the argument to Amazon. I said, the goal should not be to fulfill online orders. It should be, how do you meet the food needs of your, of your customers? 
So be able to have mobile kitchens to where they can order breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The meal is delivered to them to the home. They then also need groceries. And so you have an integrated platform where you can deliver groceries to them as well. You can deliver groceries and food together. I've really said to the rapid grocery delivery companies, especially, you're making a big mistake. If you aren't exploring some of these robotic pizza making machines, some of these machines that can do uh, hamburgers and cheeseburgers, you know, very, very quickly. And I think they need to combine a dark kitchen and a dark store. And so that when I'm sending out my couriers and my my delivery people, whether they're on bikes or scooters or vans or cars, I'm basically taking advantage of the fact that my customers want to eat a hamburger or pizza or they have groceries they want. So why not be able to provide both of those from the same company, from the same location? And so, yes, I absolutely expect that is going to happen. But going back to what I said earlier about, again, buying in bulk, uh, the way these companies can make money and the way customers can save money is if you, they, they say, you know what, we're on the same block. I'm going to order pizza from Muncho. Does anyone else want to make it, you know, want to place an order as well? And the Muncho system should easily be able to say, I have five, comp five people now placing orders on the same block and I'm going to give them dynamic pricing because of that because I've now reduced my total cost of operating this van and making a delivery. Instead of making one delivery, I'm now going to fulfill five orders within a one block radius. And imagine how that can actually take off. And look at the value that that would drive to Muncho, but also drive Absolutely. to the Yep. And as we keep going through 2022 and gas prices go up and food prices go up, I'm telling you, this generation really knows nothing of inflation or stagflation. They've never experienced it. And so I think it's going to shock a lot of people just how much money they're going to be losing in the coming few months and certainly the coming year due to inflation for food, especially in gasoline. And I think they're going to embrace these ideas that we're talking about because it's really an intelligent way for them to save money without having to give up a lot of the things they want. Right. And actually, as we were discussing all this, uh, and as we add the whole philosophy of uh, hyper-local retail, I believe that if all of these adjustments that we discuss are done, and if the scale is still driven, because you still need uh, thousands of orders from your dark store, right? We were talking about optimizing these orders. We were talking about growing the revenue streams and growing the number of orders and improving the efficiency of these orders, but you still need big time scale, right? Correct. And taking into account everything that we discussed, I believe that the model is not as much about, it's not about, the change of the model, but the improvement of the model. And if we're talking about implementing all these improvements that actually, even from the beginning, were quite visible and should have been done, it's just the market is, was actually very young and uh, actually needed to build a lot of infrastructure, find the people to do that and whatnot. Uh, I mean, you had to have this in mind in the beginning anyways, right? And now it's just getting more visible who does or who doesn't and who sees how far, right? But from the perspective of everything that we mentioned, it does look very anti-fragile because when the supply chain global is falling, when the logistics prices are skyrocketing, when you have the electricity prices uh, growing very much in all over the world, you actually have a dark store, which doesn't need as much light, which doesn't need as uh, much people if it's automated, uh, which doesn't need as much expenses of gas if it is done efficiently. You don't need the global chain as much as if you are a supermarket because you are hyper-local, your matrix is very flexible for every region and even every city and the uh, area within the city you can give the more room to the local brands. Plus we add your own 
private label on top and you're basically like a fully independent machine to conquer the whole market, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And and the reason why I like the model, uh, the flexibility of rapid grocery delivery and combining rapid grocery delivery and food delivery together is that um, the reason why I like that is it gives that ability for a small company, a rapid grocery delivery company to say hyper-locally, this is our solution to meet demand for the people who live in this region. And in another part of the city, this is our solution. And in another state, this is our solution. But what they're not carrying is a nationwide network of stores. They're not carrying a nationwide network of thousands of associates. They don't have a nationwide network of warehouses for supply chain. They're basically just ordering products from wholesalers or they're buying them from retailers and then turning around and selling them. Uh, so I, I like the idea that in a time like we are faced with, if done correctly, rapid grocery delivery companies combined with food companies or, or restaurant delivery companies, they should be able to come up with a very low cost operating model because again, their, rap, their dark stores are manual. There's not a lot of automation in there. Uh, certainly they could automate them if they wanted to. I don't think they should until they get, uh, you, you need certain amounts of volume. It doesn't make sense to automate everything just to do it. But I agree. I think that these rapid grocery delivery companies have a unique opportunity. And I've always said this, I always say to these companies, don't try and copy what grocery retailers do. Don't try and copy them. Reimagine the experience for how do you get food exactly. to a customer? How do you get groceries to a customer? Look at all the things that grocery retailers have done and say, how do we duplicate this, but better, faster, cheaper? And if they do that, they absolutely should be able to take market share away from grocery retailers. The uh, big thing is going to be price. Do they have a way to lower the price of products? And I believe they do if they use the bulk model. And if they do that, I, I'm telling you, although the rapid grocery delivery industry is under a lot of pressure, they make these changes. I really think they can be profitable because they're changing the business model. Big times. Very interesting times. <laughs> it like when you were just all saying that, um, it basically... Uh, Drew another thought in my head. It's just the time right now uh, when we're gonna see who was actually doing the homework and who was thinking where he or she will be developing their business to. Or, and the people who were just trying to get money and deliver something in 15 minutes and feel that smarter guys will come in and will do everything for me when I get the investment. Correct, correct. Um, we know those days are gone. We, we know that there's going to have to be changes there. We know for a fact that so many circumstances are changing globally. Uh, you know, we know that consumers are under pressure. So I really think that, you know, what I've said to the rapid grocery delivery industry is you did a great job of getting to this point, but what got you here won't keep you here. You need to pivot you to change and that's what i'm fully expecting we're going to see because if we don't see it then we know for a fact those companies aren't going to survive because there's no reason for them to survive uh they're the, you know pretty soon most grocery retailers will be offering 15 minute delivery they'll use instacart to do it they'll do it on their own they'll partner with someone and so then these rapid grocery delivery companies aren't going to have much to offer so the rapid grocery delivery companies, as I say, they should not try and copy what grocery retailers are doing. And they also should be putting a business model in place that, rapid, that grocery retailers can't duplicate. And this is where leveraging the volume, um, bulk sales, you know, their dark stores, private label, more hyper-local focus. And then the interesting thing is also looking at the franchise model of saying, how do we scale more rapidly? We franchise our business model and you start having lots of franchisees open up these facilities, Definitely. these businesses all throughout the US. 
And that's something that grocery retailers don't do. They don't franchise. And get to your as does. We, well, oh, get you to, mean, get, yeah, yeah, you mean the, the, the offline ones. Sorry for interrupting. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, like Tesco. You know, yes. Tesco doesn't, Tesco doesn't franchise, you know, Whole Foods doesn't franchise, but with the right franchise model, you really could open up a lot of these rapid grocery delivery companies offering private label products combined with pizza and burgers and chicken and stuff like that. And it's just an interesting model. And I think it would be very well received by the population, you know, by consumers. So we'll see, we'll see really how this progresses, but I think think we're going to see an awful lot of changes this year because I think these companies have no choice but to change. Absolutely. Uh, it was an amazing pleasure as always uh, to talk to you and to discuss the industry. Uh, previously, when we were recording in November, uh, we thought about meeting in half a year and see if something changes. Look, it's less than that uh, for three months and uh, we are back uh discussing how many changes are happening and uh, what we should expect uh i think that you shared a lot of very interesting insights today with all of us uh and uh, i believe that all this knowledge is super valuable uh to everyone who is listening so thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for this interesting conversation britain oh my pleasure and you know i'm thinking about you I'm thinking about your family. I'm thinking about everyone in Ukraine. And I just say, I hope all this ends very quickly. And I just want people to be safe, especially you. And I always enjoy speaking with you, my friend. Thank you very much, Britain. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.